Hello, everyone, and welcome. I will give just a few moments for our attendees to join the room. I see the number growing rapidly. Again, I am excited to welcome everyone to day two of the 2024 Within Health <laughs> Summit. My name is Jamie Singletary, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping things. This is a CE presentation. So in order to receive credit for today's presentation, you will need to watch this presentation live. If there are any complications or technical difficulties while watching the presentation, I will provide the CE Go contact information, email and phone number so that you can reach out to them. I'm going to also place my email in the chat feature so that you can email me if you have any questions regarding your CE certificate. Also today, we will also be highlighting one of our amazing partners that we are happy to work with. That is gonna be Dr. Nicholas Farrell of NoCD. Um, before we get started, I do wanna provide just a brief agenda. Um, Dr. Farrell will be hopping at noon or 12 EST, um, the time of the conference. And Dr. Oliver Pyatt will pick up, but will also be sharing some comments um, as Dr. Phil presents regarding OCD, because that is going to be the primary discussion of today's presentation. So without further ado, I would love to introduce our wonderful speakers. I will start with Dr. Nicholas Farrell. Dr. Thank Nicholas you. Farrell is a licensed clinical psychologist and a clinical director at NoCD, where he provides clinical leadership and direction for the network's teletherapy services. He is a recognized expert in researching and treating OCD, eating disorders, and other related conditions. He has published numerous scholarly works, including over 50 peer-reviewed journal articles, book chapters, and books, and he frequently gives presentations at international conferences on maximizing the effectiveness of treatment for OCD, eating disorders, and related conditions. He also has a wealth of experiment experience designing and overseeing several successful training programs that have enhanced the decimation of evidence-based treatment for OCD and eating disorders. Also, Dr. Wendy Oliver Pyatt, who is a world leading expert on treating eating disorders with more than 25 years of clinical experience. She has developed five distinctive treatment programs, all grounded on a strong biopsychosocial bio foundation and incorporating intensive psychotherapy with behavioral foundations and high medical standards. Wendy has developed a unique treatment approach that delves into the underlying issues that place a person at risk for mental health conditions and eating disorder and lead to healing, health, and inner peace. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Farrell and Dr. Oliver Pyatt. And I would also love for Dr. Farrell, if you would share just a little bit about NoCD and how people can contact you. Certainly. And uh, let me start with uh, thanking you, Jamie, for such a warm welcome and introduction. And I also want to uh, extend my gratitude to Dr. Oliver Pyatt for uh, having me as a, as a part of this summit. It's certainly an honor to be here presenting on behalf of uh, our company, NoCD. Uh, so just to tell you a little bit about what we do, uh, NoCD is uh, an app-based virtual teletherapy platform that provides evidence-based psychotherapy for obsessive compulsive and related conditions. Uh, some of that I'll be talking about today, uh, but we serve all 50 US states as well as Canada, uh, the United Kingdom, Australia, and we're rapidly expanding into other international territories. Our mission is to try to ease and um, eliminate global suffering associated with OCD. Um, and some of that will be a part of this presentation today. So again, I'm, I'm very, very honored to be here uh, and to speak on this subject that is uh, very, very important to me. A lot of my career has been devoted to understanding this very tricky intersection uh, between eating disorders and obsessive compulsive disorder. And I hope to really illuminate that today. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. So just an overview of what Dr. Oliver Pyatt and I will be covering over the next 90 minutes. Uh, I'm going to start by just describing some of the key features of both eating disorders and OCD. I'm sure for most of you, that'll be uh, mostly review. Uh, from there, I will move into really, I think, what most of you are here to learn more about. Uh, and that's the sort of conceptual overlap as well as comorbidity between eating disorders and obsessive compulsive disorder. We'll look at how 
uh, both conditions are maintained in a similar fashion. We'll look at some of the key maintaining factors as well as some of the critical overlap that we see between how these two types of conditions are treated. Um, and then Dr. Oliver Paya will lead uh, reviewing eating disorders and some other commonly co uh, comorbid conditions, which include uh, both ADHD as well as post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. All right, just to kind of warm up, uh, warm up our brains a little bit, I'm going to begin with a few case examples. I'll read through these briefly. Uh, so example number one, we'll use the pseudonym Savannah. Uh, Savannah is a 16-year-old high school student who's living at home with her parents, became extremely focused on uh, high achievement really throughout childhood, and uh, a lot of preoccupation with thinness as an adolescent, and not surprisingly began restricting her food intake. Other eating-related behaviors that came up for Savannah included uh, actually squeezing or manipulating food as to try to eliminate the fat content from it, as well as wiping her mouth excessively in an effort to try to reduce uh, any, any uh, caloric intake. Um, Savannah became underweight, and not surprisingly, you would imagine that there are certainly negative impacts uh, on her health as well as her cognitive abilities. Now, in addition to these eating and body image related difficulties, Savannah also experienced a lot of fear around doing things that she perceived to be imperfect, uh, whether it was with academics, as well as her participation in various athletic activities. And so what that yielded from a behavioral standpoint was a lot of repeated rituals or behaviors, all aimed at trying to basically perfect or maximize her performance. Examples included such things like rereading assignments as well as, uh, you know, completing athletic drills over and over and over again until they felt, quote unquote, just right. We'll look at a second case example now. We will call this individual Bill, uh, a 51-year-old divorced male who was working as an accountant. The primary eating-related difficulty that Bill uh, experienced was recurrent binge eating that he often felt powerless to prevent. Um, Bill became extremely self-conscious uh, of, of a larger body size, and he also became avoidant of many activities due to feared kind of anticipated scrutiny from other people. Um, in addition to these eating-related difficulties, Bill also experienced unwanted thoughts or impulses related to blurting out obscenities when speaking with other people. So in other words, the fear was, I might, um, you know, even though I don't want to, I might blurt out really, really inappropriate things when I'm interacting with other people. To try to cope with this as best as he could manage, Bill used uh, pausing in his speaking, uh, as well as other mental rituals or diversions to try to neutralize these unwanted impulses. And uh, after conversations that he had, Bill would very frequently seek reassurance from other people over whether or not he offended them. And then our third and final case example we'll call Judith. Judith was a 30-year-old female who at the time of treatment reported living alone while working at a daycare. One of Judith's primary difficulties was very intense fears of vomiting, which led to a very, very limited range of foods that Judith deemed acceptable or safe to eat. Uh, so one of the ways that Judith tried to meet her body's energy needs was through using liquid supplements. Um, in addition to this, Judith engaged in very frequent hand washing and compulsive cleaning behaviors with the aim of trying to prevent the acquisition of an illness uh, again, with the global aim of trying to minimize the likelihood that she would experience vomiting. In addition to these eating-related difficulties associated with the vomiting fears, uh, Judith also experienced very frequent unwanted mental images uh, and ideas around sexually molesting children, which, as you'd imagine, became uh, extremely distressing to her given her, her work in a daycare. So there were substantial patterns of avoidance that affected her work. Uh, for example, Judith found ways to, you know, refuse to change diapers if she was working in the infant room or something of that nature. And at the time of treatment, unfortunately, Judith's uh, symptoms had become so severe that she needed to take a leave of absence due to the profound impairment in her functioning. Dr. Nick, I just think these these case examples are so important and really highlight the level of suffering and misery of those with OCD who often are, you know, they conceal these these thoughts and feelings and behaviors out of shame and, and just because they really are disconnected from their, their own personal values and who they really are. And thank God that no CD exists so that you can reach so many more people because it's such an illness of great suffering. And I remember my very first person with OCD I treated as a psychiatry resident and 
she ate her food, her, um, she couldn't touch utensils with her hands. And, and so it was just really a learning experience for me. I'm so grateful for your expertise. Thank you for sharing these case examples. It really highlights the suffering. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Wendy. You, you couldn't be more spot on. There's profound suffering associated with both of these types of conditions, uh, Yeah. eating disorders, OCD, and more importantly, when they're comorbid, they kind of gang up uh, together. They do. Um, One so, plus one is not two in this <laughs> case. no, certainly not. Certainly not. So let's dive into these case examples a little bit more. I've, I've chosen these three and these specific uh, kind of constellations of symptoms with the intention of helping you see that Yes, although diagnostically, each of these individuals we would likely diagnose with both an eating disorder and obsessive compulsive disorder, there are some things that are important to point out here that go far beyond diagnosis. Whereas, yes, there were differences in the, the nature and the type of the symptoms that were described among these individuals, so different fears, different behaviors, but I really want to draw your attention to the similar underlying themes. Across all three individuals, there was undoubtedly a high degree of preoccupation with feared outcomes. The anticipation of those feared outcomes was met with very elevated levels of anxiety and distress. All three individuals were engaging in repetitive behaviors aimed at trying to reduce their anxiety, and at the same time, prevent or minimize the likelihood of these feared outcomes actually coming to fruition. And then last but not least, although the form of avoidance was certainly different from one person to the next, all three of these individuals could be said to be engaging in patterns of avoidance across situations that provoke anxiety. So I just want to highlight those kind of conceptual big ticket items because that's really going to be a theme uh, of the presentation today. All right, let's start with just a little bit of background into eating disorders. Uh, I'm going to guess that for most of you, this is just mere review, but I can move through this rather quickly. Uh, eating disorders are defined as a disturbance in eating-related behavior that results in an altered pattern of food consumption. And this altered pattern of food consumption can range from the extremes uh, of, of extreme undereating to extreme overeating. But that altered pattern of food consumption, regardless of the form it takes, is typically responsible for substantial impairment in functioning and physical health, as well as one's psychological uh, well-being overall. Uh, in the table here, you can see that on the left-hand side, we've listed some of the common types or forms that eating disorders take, uh, as well as some of the main features listed. Now, this list here is certainly not exclusive. Uh, of course, DSM-5 includes more than just uh, more than just five eating disorder diagnoses, but see, these are some of the common themes in terms of the symptom presentations that we see. I do wanna highlight at the bottom orthorexia, which is not yet technically recognized as a quote unquote formal eating disorder diagnosis, but it is nonetheless a relatively common presentation that you'll undoubtedly see if you work, you know, kind of in the eating disorders interest, uh, industry. And this is marked by extreme levels of preoccupation with kind of the nutritional value and content of foods and can lead to, you know, levels of, of uh, limitation in the variety in one's diet that are comparable to some of the more common or classic eating disorder types like, like anorexia, uh, bulimia, binge eating disorder, and, and ARFID as well. So uh, an increasingly prevalent uh, condition or, or manifestation of eating-related pathology that we see. And I'll just say to add to that, um, within our population at Within, we do also see a lot of co-occurring OCD with the orthorexia nervosa. And it's a particularly difficult condition to treat because the the fixation on the quote health of food is really, you know, it's a hard thing to sort of debate with somebody if they're like distilling it down to the particular va health value of a food. So we always try to help orthorexia patients shift from the the paradigm of health of food to healthy relationship with food. But orthorexia and, o and ARFID are also where we are seeing a lot of the co-occurring OCD. And that's really how no CD and, and within got so tight was that there was, the, we're, we're doing this talk because it's emblematic of like the, the patients that we serve and the importance of treating the complex comorbidity. So it's, a you know, just, just some comments there. Um, where we see a lot of the OCD in those those bottom two that you mentioned here. 
Yeah, absolutely. Lots of comorbidity between obsessive compulsive uh, obsessive compulsive disorder and those conditions. And more yeah. importantly, as as you've highlighted, Dr. Wendy, lots of overlap in terms of the yeah. you know kind of the key features of both problem areas. Um, yeah. A little bit of background about the prevalence of eating disorders. Um, you know, we we know that um, although eating disorders, of course, can occur theoretically at just about any age across the lifespan, uh, they mm -hmm. can be in many ways characterized as disorders of youth. Um, there are statistics that show that among people that are diagnosed with an eating disorder, something in the ballpark of about 90% kind of fall between the ages of 12 and 25. Um, and we, we notice that as the adolescent years progress, unfortunately, we tend to see prevalence rates escalating during that critical phase or period of life. Uh, it's estimated currently that about 1 million teenagers alone in the United States uh, struggle with eating disorders. That's one in 20. So if you go to your average size high school, I mean, we're, we're talking about um, at least, you know, 10 to 20 kids um, in, in, in a given year cohort. You know, eating disorders historically were thought of as almost exclusively uh, uh, being disorders that were a quote unquote female problem. Um, but we we know that, um, you know, contemporarily um, men are can and often are affected by eating disorders. It's now estimated that uh, approximately 20, 30 percent, 20 to 30 percent of uh, diagnosed cases with eating disorders identify as male. Even if we're not talking about kind of quote unquote, full threshold eating disorders. We know that nonetheless, subthreshold features of eating disorders are very common in youth. Uh, in the United States alone, over half of teenage girls and even close to a third of teenage boys report, you know, periodic engagement in unhealthy weight control behaviors, including but certainly not limited to fasting behaviors, using self-induced vomiting as a form of weight control. And even in our real littles, Kids, you know, between the ages of six and 12, uh, over half will endorse concern about weight, shape, body size, et cetera. So certainly uh, a, a growing epidemic and, of course, something that presents a, a very significant risk to physical health and well-being. Very sad. Indeed. Mm. Yeah. Conceptually, it is... Um, defensible to view eating disorders kind of through a transdiagnostic lens. I realized that a couple of slides ago, you know, we showed some different eating disorder diagnoses and looked at some of the distinct features of those. But what I think is important to draw attention towards is how we can view eating disorders often through a transdiagnostic lens, where there's less emphasis given to what makes anorexia distinct from bulimia and distinct from ARFID. Uh, and so on and so forth, and rather placing our emphasis on the shared features across different eating disorder diagnoses. A couple of the reasons why, oh, go ahead, Wendy, please. Oh, no, I was going to say, I'm so glad that you're pointing this out, because back in my early career, there was this idea sometimes that, oh, there should be a treatment program over here for the anorexia nervosa patients and over here for the BED patients, when in fact, you know, there's some research that shows up to 60% of people with anorexia nervosa it will convert into a binge eating disorder. Binge eating disorder patients, even though they technically don't have compensatory behavior, they're very, very restrictive when you get them in your program and you're actually trying to get them to eat. So the idea that the binge eater is just sitting around binging, well, a lot of times they're restricting. So I'm, I'm so glad you pointed this out because in real life, the patients really do well when they commingle. And I always say like, when they interact with each other and form these bonds, I, I think what happens is the person with anorexia can develop more compassion for the, the binger that she or he is suppressing inside mm -hmm. of her. And the binge eating disorder person can sort of see, oh, wow, there's this anorexia part of me. They kind of recognize these parts of themselves and develop compassion for these parts of themselves through that recognition and seeing it in another so often. So not only is it, um, you know, a good, it, it's it's a good idea to have these patients intermingling, in my opinion. So I'm so glad. I that couldn't agree that. more. Yeah. Yeah. And Dr. Wendy, you've highlighted, you know, what is very common in a, in a typical course of eating disorder. You know, when we follow it over the years, uh, like you point out, uh, more than half of people experience this phenomena of diagnostic migration where, yeah. you know, in the early formative stages, we see food restriction and weight loss being the, the predominant features. But 
you, yeah, absolutely. A lot of these individuals eventually kind of transition or migrate yeah. to develop a problematic binge eating tendencies. And then there can be the arrival of the onset of unhelpful coping strategies, compensatory behaviors, yes. excessive you can see exercising. The whole, the whole trajectory. I, my dad, yes. when I was a little girl growing up, he taught me this thought of this concept of there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. And I was like, you'd always tell me this, right? No, so she was free lunch. I was like, what are you talking? But I, 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 I talk about that with our patients. Like I always say, you know, you don't like all this restriction. You don't get away with it for free. It's mm -hmm. gonna result in medical consequences, psychiatric consequences, and like you're pointing out, can merge into these other presentations. So yeah. there ain't no such thing as a free lunch with eating disorders. <laughs> right on. Well, let's dig into some of these shared features a little bit more on the next slide. Again, if we put aside diagnostic differences or distinctions for a second, let's focus on some of the shared features, the common threads that we see run through different eating disorders, regardless of diagnosis. Um, arguably, eating disorders, you know, what, what lies at the heart of them are, you know, really significant core beliefs related to feared consequences about what may happen or what, what I won't be able to handle or tolerate or live with in my life. Um, some examples of this, um, you know, we, I, I pulled these examples directly from individuals that I've treated over the years. If I eat any more than a thousand calories a day, I'll gain weight uncontrollably. If a certain food disgusts me, I cannot tolerate that feeling of disgust or being nauseous. Unless I'm very thin and toned, no one will ever want to be around me. I'll just be completely unacceptable as a person. Eating any solid food makes it likely that I'll choke and possibly suffocate. So again, from, from one individual to the next, the nature of these core feared beliefs can be very different, but that, that's a very important common thread running through different eating disorders. I think it's so important that I love that you're doing these core beliefs because I always like to point out to the staff, like, let's don't just be, we do have to do the symptom, you know, treating the actual symptoms with like the ER. Mm -hmm. note. But if we don't understand like the belief that is in that person's mind by, by that connection and relationship, we can't really totally untangle this. So core beliefs Absolutely. are so important. The relationship is the foundation to get to those core beliefs, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly intense negative emotions we see very common uh, to eating disorders, again, regardless of diagnosis here. Some of the most common ones, but it's certainly not limited to just those that are included in this list. You know, fear and anxiety, guilt, sadness, shame. Dr. Wendy, before we got on this morning, you talked about how excited you were to speak later today about the 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 construct of shame and, and its importance in understanding eating disorders. Yeah, thank you. Of course. Out. Yeah. Uh, behavioral tendencies that we see common to eating disorders include uh, avoidance as a general coping strategy that feels effective in the short run, but ultimately proves to be ineffective and a big maintaining factor of eating disorders in the long run. We also see individuals attempt to cope with fears and distress through use of what we call safety behaviors. These are actions aimed at trying to decrease or suppress those, uh, th those negative emotions and at the same time, prevent or minimize the likelihood of feared outcomes. You're going to see me connect some of the dots later uh, to help you understand how OCD and eating disorders are maintained kind of via similar pathways. But some common examples that we see pulled directly from practice uh, amongst individuals with eating disorders uh, include the following. Restricting food intake in an effort to try to prevent feared weight gain taking very, very small bites of food, aiming to try to prevent a feared choking episode, wearing only extremely baggy forms or fitting clothing to try to prevent anticipated scrutiny of one's body size or shape, and then compulsively exercising to burn calories with the aim of trying to prevent the development of a quote unquote bad or unacceptable or undesirable physique. Lastly, I want to highlight the critical um, role that overvaluation of body shape and weight play and is central to many different eating disorders. This is when an individual's kind of scheme or mode of evaluating themselves, as well as how they perceive themselves to be evaluated by the rest of the world, becomes very much dominated, sometimes exclusively determined by one's own perceptions of their weight and shape. And as I've mentioned for, for several decades, this has been considered one of the most central psychological constructs 
uh, across different eating disorder diagnoses. I want to show you on the next slide just an illustration that depicts this. For most of us, if we were asked to identify what life domains or areas factor into uh, just kind of how we think about ourselves, the basis of our self-evaluation and how we kind of assume the rest of the world views us, you see that in this kind of pie here, there, there are different slices of the pie uh, involving different life domains. And, you know, prior to the onset of an eating disorder, uh, this, this may be what it looks like for somebody before the onset of their symptoms. Now, if we fast forward a few years, when one is unfortunately in the throes of their eating disorder, we now see that this equation has become completely taken over or dominated by those perceptions of weight and shape. So those things that may have been previously important or highly valued to the person, you know, the quality of my friendships, the time that I get to spend with my family, job satisfaction, academic success, all that goes out the window. It pales in comparison to the number I see when I step on the scale or just the, the feeling I get when I look at myself in a mirror. All right, I'm now gonna transition into talking more about obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD. Uh, according to the World Health Organization, we know that OCD has consistently been ranked as one of the top 10 in terms of the most disabling uh, conditions worldwide. Um, this really underscores one of the fundamental misunderstandings about OCD. Unfortunately, the, the lay public, uh, it's common to view you know, a condition like OCD as kind of a disorder that um, may come with some positive perks to it, like you have a nice tidy house because you have OCD, or it's really a condition that isn't associated with much interference with life. It's just kind of something that you live with and manage. These things couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, again, the the extent of disability and just general impairment in functioning and interference with one's lifestyle that we see in the treatment of individuals with OCD is truly profound. Yeah, I, when I ever hear when people say, oh, she's being OCD, he's being OCD, <laughs> sort of like very lightly, you know, that I think as health, mental health providers, we want to be kind of cautious about that. I'm so glad you pointed that out. Absolutely. Yep, you bet. Um, if we could go back to the, the previous slide. Sure, sorry. Uh, just a couple of, no, you're fine, you're fine. Um, <laughs> an OCD, we know very consistently goes under-recognized. Um, it, uh, we, we, we don't detect it very well. I think we have a long way as a field to go with screening better and really creating safer spaces where individuals can feel safe and free of shame and embarrassment to, to disclose what symptoms that they may be experiencing. And for that reason, it is, considered in many ways a, a, hidden, epi a hidden epidemic. Um, we know that it's highly prevalent when we consider just adults in the US. Estimates are currently at over 8 million. That's about the number of individuals living in New York City. Um, wow. it's, also, it's also prevalent uh, very much in children and adolescents. In an average high school, we would expect to see at least two kids in every high school classroom that may be experiencing clinically elevated levels of obsessive compulsive symptoms. So definitely something that goes under recognized. And uh, we know in clinical settings, if we don't screen, if we don't deliberately explicitly ask questions about obsessive compulsive symptoms that a person may or may not be experiencing, they often will not self-disclose and the condition goes undetected. All right, just to highlight some of the key features that are central to understanding OCD, like the name suggests, it is very much a two-part condition. Uh, first, there are obsessions, which are defined as intrusive, and the key word that I want to highlight here, unwanted ideation. Mm -hmm. These could include thoughts that come to mind, mental images, impulses, ideas, and what these unwanted um, ideas or mental, mental phenomena produce is really elevated levels of distress and anxiety. They are interpreted uh, as an indication that something's wrong and that there's potential threat or danger that exists. So naturally, these trigger intense negative emotions. Um, some of these look familiar because we talked about them in the context of eating disorders. Fear, anxiety, disgust, a big one in OCD, doubt about whether things are okay and whether I've done something properly, whether I might be responsible for something bad happening. Um, in many cases, we know that individuals with OCD 
on some level, they recognize that the symptoms don't really make sense. They don't pass the eye test. They don't hold a lot of water. That is to say they are ego dystonic. Mm -hmm. One views them as inconsistent with their self-concept. So there aren't really, honestly, you know, sometimes the degree of warped beliefs that people assume in OCD. Um, anecdotally, the majority of people with OCD that say fear um, contamination or being responsible for a house fire or being responsible for harming a loved one, they understand on a logical level that the likelihood of those catastrophes is very low. Mm -hmm. And yet there's a difficult time being able to accept and live with that uncertainty. Yeah. One thing you might be recognizing as you hear me describe some of the common features of OCD is that experiencing occasional unwanted thoughts or ideas coming to our minds is normative. We know it's just part of the human experience to occasionally have an unpleasant thought or idea or mental image come to mind. Okay. So if we go to the next slide, one of the important things to ask ourselves is, well, if everybody experiences intrusive thoughts, how do these become obsessions? Mm. That is to say, if it's just part of the human condition to occasionally have a, a strange, unwanted, and unpleasant thought come to mind, um, how does that develop for some people into full-blown OCD? Well, let's follow the top part of this figure. If an individual experiences an intrusive thought, we know that for most of us, for whatever reason, we're able to interpret the presence of this thought as harmless. Yeah. So imagine I might be driving in my car, going over a bridge, and in the act of doing that, I'm hit with a thought that comes to mind that, hmm, it would be easy right now to just take my hands, jerk the steering wheel, and off the car goes, you know, tumbling over the edge of the bridge. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, for most of us, although, again, the experience of that thought occasionally is just a universal part of being a human, we interpret the presence of this thought as harmless. It's meaningless. And because of that, there's minimal, if any, experience of anxiety, and the unwanted thought then becomes very easy to discard. You know, kind of as simple as, wow, what a bizarre thought. Wonder why that came to mind. <laughs> Doesn't mean anything. I guess I'll just carry on driving. Yeah. That is very different, unfortunately, from somebody who goes on to develop OCD. The presence of that thought, rather than being viewed as harmless or insignificant, is interpreted as being very meaningful, very significant, potentially indicative of a threat, a danger. And so the individual experiences intense anxiety and not surprisingly, then this thought, this idea becomes very difficult to discard and it becomes very repetitive and comes back to kind of haunt the person on a on a consistent basis. That's so I just want to say that so reminds me of what I talk about when I talk about when I work with people with eating disorders, because mm. many people might have like, for example, negative body image in the morning, right? But okay, I have negative body image, but I put on my pants and I go to work. It's like, ah, oh, I have bought negative body image. Off we go. And, and I'm able to put aside that negative body image. Some part of my brain is going, ah, sucks. Got to go to work. The person with an eating disorder may have that same thought, but the guardrail on that thought, right? The guardrail isn't working. The, gu the guardrail is not helping me. The guardrail is like, catastrophe you know so, <laughs> and it's and that's where it's like people think of behaviors as people we often think behaviors are a choice because we're like well mm -hmm. you're doing it your brain you're you chose not to go to work and what we sometimes forget is like people actually get flooded they actually because the thought is so intense and and difficult if not impossible to discard the behavior really isn't you know maybe you know where where is the line between a choice and not a choice when these thoughts are so intense and the guardrail isn't there to go, hey, thought, you know, nice to meet you. I'll see you later. You know, so this, <laughs> so this slide, when I saw this, I was like, wow, this so feels like working with eating disorder patients where we're having to teach them to work with those thoughts. 100 percent, Dr. So Wendy, definitely yeah. highlighting a lot of that conceptual overlap that we see between OCD and eating disorders. Yeah. Um, arguably, you could say the same thing about this slide. Compulsions, yeah. I, I guess the the term has always been somewhat unique to eating disorder, excuse me, to, to OCD, but certainly yeah. you see compulsive, repetitive safety Absolutely. behaviors cropping up in eating disorders. Yeah. Um, 
So historically, when we've used the term compulsions, this is a term that refers to uh, a very common feature of OCD, and that involves the repetitive behaviors. And I want to highlight the second form that this can take, mental actions. Anecdotally, I would argue that for every overt or behavioral compulsion that you see in a person with OCD, there are just as many hidden, covert mental activities that are just not observable or detectable to the naked eye. These behaviors are done with the intent to try to, in some way, neutralize, again, what the person perceives as a threat, as a danger, as a risk posed by the obsessional thought. As you'd imagine, these behaviors, because of their highly repetitive nature, often become extremely time-consuming and they get in the way, they rob the person from being able to really live their life how they want to. Uh, and this, I think, underscores a point I made earlier about how OCD is so you know, debilitating on average. Now, the person, again, on some level, recognizes that the compulsions may be unnecessary or may be excessive or unreasonable, you know, disproportionate, that is to say, with the degree of actual threat that's present. So then the question becomes, well, if the person can recognize that it's not necessary to wash your hands 10 times, say, after taking the garbage out, why do they continue to do that? And the answer is because, well, those behaviors, they are temporarily reinforced. They relieve the anxiety that a person experiences and they seem, from the sufferer's point of view, to be successful, to be useful in preventing those significant negative consequences that are feared. You probably won't be surprised to know that the obsessions that we see in patients that suffer with OCD, as well as the compulsions, don't just occur at random. There are some very predictable common pairings. That is to say, the nature of the intrusive unwanted thoughts or the obsessions are often paired with compulsions in a way that kind of makes theoretical sense. To illustrate, individuals that experience obsessional distress or thoughts or concerns, say, around bodily fluids, germs, other perceived contaminants in the environment, we see this very commonly linked to compulsive behaviors that include repetitive hand washing, excessive bathing or cleaning, or just avoidance of contact with, you know, common objects or surfaces in general. People that experience obsessional distress related to having unwanted thoughts about potentially being responsible for really significant catastrophes or misfortune, it is common for those to be met with compulsions that include excessive checking to try to make sure that no harm was done or no harm will be done. Individuals that experience obsessional thoughts or distress over a perceived need for things to be ordered or arranged or even just to feel a certain way, uh, what's often referred to as the just right phenomena, not surprisingly, these obsessions are linked with compulsive behaviors that include ordering, fixing things, straightening, or repeating actions or things or activities until they feel just right to the individual. And finally, individuals that experience thoughts that they deem to be personally unacceptable, maybe amoral. Common example of this might include amongst uh, among religious individuals experiencing thoughts of sacrilege or blasphemy, or uh, individuals experiencing sexual thoughts that are inappropriate or taboo in some way. These thoughts are commonly met with compulsive behaviors that might include mental actions, such as praying, trying to undo things in one's mind, or some type of mental diversion or uh, distraction to try to uh, neutralize the unwanted thought. I want to take a few minutes to highlight uh, what things that are often misunderstood as OCD, but are not in fact OCD. Um, in my estimation, I, I realize I have somewhat of a of a bias here, uh, but I, I do think that obsessive compulsive disorder is among the most misunderstood mental health conditions that are, are in existence. Um, so I want to do I, I, I want to highlight some things that um, I think sometimes the lay public assumes, oh, that's OCD, but we we don't really consider it to be OCD. Um, first of all, I guess I'm personally not a fan of the name. 
uh, because the term, the clinical term obsession is often confused with the use of the word obsession in a more lay sense. Um, when we think of the, the, the term obsession, we think of things that we become really preoccupied with that dominate our, our kind of cognitive space. You know, maybe we're fascinated with a particular idea or a desire. Um, back when I used to spend most of my career working in higher levels of care in hospital-based settings, you would be surprised by the number of times that we would get calls and screen individuals that would say things along the lines of, I need help because it seems I'm obsessed with video games or my child is obsessed with um, <laughs> things like online shopping or gambling or things like this, um, even becoming obsessed with, say, following a celebrity, becoming obsessed with another person in the form of stalking, even obsessed with like true, tr true crime dramas or mass shootings. These things where there's a particular idea that we become preoccupied with, where there's maybe an element of desire or fascination is not what characterizes obsessive compulsive disorder. Another way that OCD is misunderstood is just based on the repetitive or the apparent compulsive nature of a behavior that seems to be done uh, with a lot of repetition. But there are many quote unquote compulsive behaviors that we think would be better characterized as impulse control problems. Remember that in the you know, classic sense, compulsions we define as a behavior aimed at trying to reduce or eliminate anxiety and at the same time prevent a feared consequence. Now, there may be problematic repetitive behaviors that a person experiences. Common examples might include lying, gambling, excessive shopping, pornography use, substance use, and certainly there's a highly repetitive nature to those behaviors. But in the majority of cases, we do not see behaviors of this nature done with the explicit with the explicit aim of neutralizing some fear or preventing a feared consequence from occurring. And then lastly, again, OCD tends to be misunderstood um, in the form of just, you know, kind of common neurotic quirks or other idiosyncrasies that all of us experience. You know, it's it's so common to hear someone say, oh, I'm a little OCD. And that that mischaracterizes you know, what we know is common in the human experience. Um, this can include, you know, people might say, oh, I have to set my alarm clock in the morning at a time that's even. Doesn't matter if it's six o'clock, doesn't matter if it's 6.10, 6.20, but God forbid I was to do it at 6.23. I could never do it on an odd number. Maybe one might check a text to try to detect spelling mistakes or grammatical errors before sending it. Maybe one engages in little odd idiosyncrasies, like when I drive past a cemetery, I just feel this uh, need to hold my breath. Um, these are behaviors that might on the surface resemble OCD, but many individuals do these things without, you know, any sort of substantial impairment in their functioning or considerable emotional distress, just the odd quirk here or there. OCD is also, think, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Dr. Wendy. Just to clarify, I want to make sure you have, what you just said is so important. So mm. it's that functional piece that you're saying. It's like, you might have these things, but if it's not really getting in the way then we as providers need to not oh, not jump on this, oh, this is OCD. It's really getting into the functioning and the impairment. Thank you for that. Absolutely, yeah, the, we, we need to see their, you know, very, very clear disturbance uh, in an individual's ability to function or just generally live their life how they, how they want to be. Um, you know, often OCD is considered sort of a synonym for what's more commonly referred to as someone being a clean freak or a neat freak or other, other similar descriptions. Um, and then finally, sometimes OCD is misunderstood as an abnormally narrowed range of interests that we might see more commonly in individuals that experience autism spectrum disorder. All right, so on this slide, I am going to attempt to use this graphic to kind of try to tie all this together. What you've heard me go on about for the last 20 minutes or so, if some of the very common features, some of the common threads that we see run through not only OCD and eating disorders, and this is now my attempt to help you kind of unite the two and to see uh, a common pathway of both the development of the condition, but more importantly, the maintenance of the condition. So we'll start at the top and kind of work our way downward. Again, what we know lies at the heart of obsessive compulsive disorder and other similar fear and anxiety-based conditions is a core belief in relation to a certain stimulus or group of stimuli. 
And we're going to use the individual who might experience intrusive, unwanted thoughts or ideas that they could be responsible for harming children, even though, of course, this person knows that deep down they would never want to do this sort of thing. But nonetheless, this fear remain, uh, will remain intact for individuals, and in just a second, you'll see why. So the core belief in this individual might be if I just have a thought, just the mere act of thinking about hurting kids, the presence of that thought must mean that I'm prone to do it, must mean I'm inclined to actually act on those very disturbing thoughts. This will naturally increase this person's kind of attentional, their, their, their threat radar for trying to detect risk or threat or danger in the environment is going to be naturally drawn towards children. So say this person is trying to go about their business, they're trying to live their life, they just go for a, a casual walk around their neighborhood, they're not going to be able to help the fact that their attention, say, is drawn to the sight or sounds of children playing on a playground. If this individual is to encounter this stimuli, this will be met with a what we call a fear expectancy. This is kind of a situation-specific prediction or assumption of this is what's going to go wrong in this situation. So in this example, it might be if I get too close to the kids playing on the playground, I might do harm. It's the expectancy or the anticipation of something really bad that happens that drives the really pronounced uh, anxiety and fear response, often accompanied by distressing bodily sensations like a racing heart, breathlessness, trembling. And these bodily sensations tend to enhance the sense of realness of the fear expectancy. That individual that, say, is a block away from the playground that starts to feel a racing heart, feeling out of breath, starting to shake and tremble might go, I wouldn't have these sensations unless there was a genuine risk. I better turn around and walk in the other direction. Safety behaviors. These are, again, these actions that we take aimed at trying to prevent or neutralize the feared outcome. So this person, again, might choose to walk away from the kids. If that is unavoidable, say if the person has to go by this playground to get home, they might use covert mental rituals. They might chant silently in their head. I won't hurt the kids, I won't hurt the kids, or something like that. And the most critical part of this figure that I'm showing you is the arrow drawn from safety behaviors back up to the top. These mm -hmm. safety behaviors serve to strengthen and maintain this wow. core belief, right? The, the person never gets to experience or acquire new learning that would help to kind of deconstruct the core belief. This is so interesting um, to really think about the work with eating disorders, because mm. I'm always talking about how when we have this idea of this catastrophic thing happening with food and we don't then eat the feared food or experience the fullness in our body, it just reinforces. And by actually eating the food um, and experiencing the fullness as, as examples, it's, I always say it's sort of like biofeedback for your brain. Your brain has the hypothesis of a catastrophe. Your brain's going, there is going to be a catastrophe if this happens, but by actually doing it, you're, and then the catastrophe didn't happen. You're literally teaching your brain, Hey, your hypothesis was a little off my dear. So it's, <laughs> it's really, that's really how, I mean, I think of, I think of ERP almost as like biofeedback for your brain where you're, a hypothesis that your brain's holding on to has to get sort of challenged. So it's, it's just so interesting to see the overlap here. Very much so, Dr. Wendy. And you've, you've beautifully kind of foreshadowed the next slide. Oh. Uh, what, what, <laughs> I, Oops, the, 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 no, 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 I you're, you, that's great. Side. That's great. Uh, the, 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 the takeaway message here is this model is very, very applicable to individuals with eating disorders. Certainly, some of the content changes, right? You see different words in the purple boxes. But nonetheless, the same pathway, this same conceptual model can be very arguably applied to understand the, the, the maintenance uh, of eating disorders. If the core belief is, if eating to the point of fullness will produce uncontrollable substantial weight gain, this individual's attention and perception is going to be drawn towards those physiological sensations of fullness. And so if an individual experiences those physiological sensations, 
this will provoke that fear expectancy. <gasps> Feeling this way means I must be going to gain a ton. It's going to be out of control. Um, excessive anxiety and fear, nausea, overheating, chest tightness. Notice I've slightly tweaked the nature of the physical experience here, but I've done that deliberately because we know that folks with eating disorders often misattribute or misunderstand these bodily sensations. If I feel a little nauseous, if I feel a little overheated, if I feel chest tightness post-eating, that must be a surefire indication that I've overdone it and now weight will completely spiral out of control. This is, of course, what leaves the individual feeling very inclined to need to do something about this, right? There's a, there's a, a catastrophe that I'm anticipating, and I've got to prevent that. Safety behaviors come into play here. I might excessively check my weight. I might uh, engage in obligatory exercising aimed at trying to prevent this from occurring. You know, self-purging uh, um, behaviors, lots of different examples could come to play here. So I'll wrap up my portion of this by just kind of highlighting some of the really important treatment overlap uh, that exists between in, um, uh, obsessive, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder and eating disorders. Um, what is currently viewed as uh, one of the most um, effective and kind of considered the gold standard uh, treatment approach for individuals with obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, Dr. Wendy has already mentioned it by name, ERP, that stands for Exposure and Response Prevention. Uh, remember how we talked just a few minutes ago how OCD is sort of a two-part condition? Well, to address it, ERP is kind of a, a one-two punch, if you will. It involves the following two major uh, interventions. The individual will first need to be willing to uh, confront feared stimuli, feared and avoided situations. That's where the exposure, that's the E part of ERP. Now, the RP part is equally critical. We have to work to help the individual prevent their engagement in those safety behaviors. Remember, safety behaviors we view as one of the key maintaining factors uh, in OCD and as well as eating disorders. And so these behaviors must become an important target, uh, aiming to reduce and then eventually eliminate them as much as we can. Uh, ERP is a, a very central ingredient to you know, nearly all cognitive behavioral therapy treatment approaches across uh, not only obsessive compulsive disorder, but related anxiety-based conditions as well. I mean, one of the reasons it's considered, you know, kind of the, the gold standard or first-line treatment for OCD is uh, the, the impressive track record that ERP has with producing, you know, really good uh, outcomes uh, for individuals uh, with obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, we, we see the success rates pretty comparable to some of the most effective pharmacological options. And for that reason, uh, national healthcare organizations like APA here in the United States uh, and then NICE in the United Kingdom, uh, they have published clinical practice guidelines that highlight ERP as a frontline approach in the treatment of OCD. Can I just say one thing, Dr. Nick? I just want to Please. highlight for the audience. I, my brother, a little anecdote, he had a friend, uh, actually a roommate who had OCD, and this person was seeing a therapist for many, many, many years, and he had, um, among other behaviors, compulsive hand washing. And it was just so sad to me that he wasn't getting ERP. And I, I eventually heard about it and he eventually did. Mm. But um, that's why it's important for the audience. I, I'm so grateful that no CD is here because you do such amazing work in vivo, in the person's life. And this is where also that idea that remote care is like, you know, sub, sub, subpar to brick and mortar. What's so powerful and effective that you're doing at no CD is that you're in that person's life with their actual rituals and behaviors that are part of their daily life and you're able to actually do the ERP in their life and without that they continue to be you know stuck in those safety behaviors and so I remember that so clearly with my my brother's roommate and and how the importance of going you know it's not okay to just sit and talk about the OCD like it's a real hands-on behavioral change that you have to make happen and you guys are just doing miraculous work and helping these millions of people. Um, oh. And so it's just, it is goal. I'm so glad that you're pointing out it's gold. It's not okay to just talk about eating disorders. It's not okay <laughs> to talk about your, you know, you actually have to, we always say ch feelings chase behavior. So the behaviors do have to actually change. And so I'm so grateful for the work you all do. Yeah, 
really appreciate you highlighting that, uh, Dr. Wendy. You're exactly right. You know, one of the um, silver linings, uh, if you could use that term related to the pandemic, is I think it forced uh, mm -hmm. our community to learn quickly yeah. uh, about some of the benefits of being able to do uh, ERP virtually. And you couldn't yeah. be more spot on when you say one of the benefits is that we we get to go with the client yeah. to the, the setting, the context where the work needs to occur. I can't tell you the number of times in a traditional brick and mortar setting, clinics, hospitals, where you know the patient comes in and it's okay, here's what we need to do for exposure. The problem is it's an hour across town. Exactly. Um, <laughs> or it's <laughs> it's only my bathroom at home, not the bathroom that you exactly. all have here in the clinic. <laughs> exactly. exactly, so that assumption is really not true with, with, with OCD for sure. And I'm certainly finding that true for many situations with eating disorders, but I know we have to keep going. Sorry. I, I, no, no, no. I appreciate bringing it. up so much when you're talking. <laughs> <I just thought. laughs> yeah. Um, given that I'm sure this, uh, our, our audience are very knowledgeable about eating disorders. I'll just very quickly highlight some of the critical components in, in uh, successful treatment of eating disorders, uh, including cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, family-based treatment, FBT, predominantly for youngsters. Uh, and then we we also highlight the uh, significant importance of comprehensive uh, comprehensive uh, nutritional rehabilitation as a, as a key ingredient in the recovery process. Um, what we want to highlight here, though, is that all of these emphasize what is inherently exposure, yeah. right? We have to confront distressing stimuli. We have to work towards eating not only normalized portions of food, but incorporating feared foods into our diet, as well as other feared and avoided stimuli like mirrors. And just like ERP, we have to pair that with the prevention of safety behaviors. We have to work towards reducing and eventually eliminating compulsive or obligatory exercising, self-induced vomiting, repetitive body checking, and the like. So the, the name of the game here is that exposure is uh, very much a key ingredient in the treatment of eating disorders as well. So this is when I get to kind of wrap it up with a nice bow on top and summarize uh, what you've hopefully taken away. Um, if we look at this in the form of our, our good old friend, a Venn diagram, <laughs> if we look at the two bubbles on the outside, yes, certainly there are some things that make eating disorders and OCD distinct from one another. Arguably, though, those things that make them distinct are in form primarily. When we look at function, this yeah. is where I think we see the overlap. This is the middle part of the Venn diagram. Regardless of whether we're talking about OCD or eating disorders, both types of conditions are um, you know, marked by negative core beliefs that produce you know, consistent anxiety and distress. There is frequent and consistent avoidance of anxiety and other unpleasant or unwanted emotional experiences. Related to that, individuals that experience both types of conditions, and especially when they present comorbidly, we see really, really, um, you know, consistent use of maladaptive behaviors. But, you know, the, these behaviors are things that work for the individual. They seem to work. They okay. seem to keep life together. They seem to fend off or keep at bay you know, scary things from happening to the person. And that, again, drives the continued use of them. And fortunately, both types of conditions we see respond well to treatment approaches and therapy models that incorporate uh, exposure-based treatment methods. Anything you want to add to that, uh, Dr. Wendy? Oh, well, this, is, this is a great Venn diagram. And I think that's, <laughs> that, that function piece is very important. Um, what an important concept. Great. Well, this is the part where um, I've unfortunately got a, a, another obligation I must attend to, so I'll sign off. I just want to thank uh, Dr. Wendy and Jamie and all the great folks at Within Health for having me one more time. It's been a, a pleasure, and I really hope you took something away from what I've presented today. Thank you so much, everybody. This was a great presentation. I'm so glad that we got to do this together. I know that your schedule's so tight, so thank you for squeezing in the time. We really appreciate it. Um, so, um, and then folks can, um, if they have any questions, we'll get those questions out to you, Dr. Nick. And Perfect. we're just honored. What a great work you do at NOCD. Thank you for everything you do. And, My uh, pleasure. Thank you so much for having take me. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. We're going to go ahead and move on now to um, kind of follow this up. We thought it might be interesting, um, given this talk, to talk about some other conditions 
that have this complex overlap be between eating disorders and other primary mental health conditions. Um, it's kind of interesting to me to have been able to have the honor to work with Dr. Nick because probably 10 or 15 years ago, I actually did a talk where I basically chose um, three psychiatric diagnoses that I saw so often in our patients with eating disorders where there's that significant comorbidity. And um, one of those was OCD and the other two are ADHD and PTSD. And uh, as Dr. Nick was saying that when a person has this complex um, commingling of symptoms, it's not a one plus one equals two. It is when you have, you know, the OCD as a primary condition with like repetitive intrusive thoughts as a primary kind of function of what your brain is doing, um, it can easily be intermingled with the eating disorder thought of like preoccupation with counting calories, let's say. So it, it actually ex exaggerates and it puts, it's sort of like putting fuel on the fire for whatever those eating disorder symptoms when they get intermingled with the primary mental health conditions. And we sort of have to remind ourselves, we've come up with these diagnoses like OCD, ADHD, PTSD. We, we created the DSM because we do our best to, we're doing our best to understand what people are suffering with so that we can treat them. But we're really just like these human beings with these brains and, you know, there's, there's ways our brains are working and it's, it's not surprising that there's this commingling. We're just thinking of them as separate conditions, but it's one person experiencing these different um, thoughts, behaviors, feelings, cognitions, etc. So um, I'm going to start with ADHD. Um, I see a lot of ADHD with folks with eating disorders. I see a lot of ADHD with all forms of eating disorders. Uh, I see a lot of ADHD with binge eating disorder too, specifically. Um, not knowing this audience super well because we try to reach out to not just um, clinicians in, in our summit. That's one of the points of our summit. Um, so I have some re potentially redundant, com you know, redundant to people who know the field. But with ADHD, there's this inattentive type, which is really that person who seems to not give attention to detail. Sometimes it's misunderstood, like you just don't care, you know, but the person's brain is really just not adhering to those details. Uh, it's really a challenge to sustain attention. It's not a choice. It's the brain literally kind of fizzing out. Um, because of that, the person may not seem like they're listening. Um, they may not complete tax, tasks. They're thought of as a strong starter and a poor finisher, poor organization. Avoidance is another big one, avoiding tasks, losing things, very distracted, um, forgetful. And a lot of these inattentive things get misconstrued as laziness or apathy or not caring um, and sort of get a moral spin put, the, put on them which is something that we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, then the hyperactivity um, comes in in all these different ways, fidgety, um, um, kind of difficulty time relaxing. The person may not be able to sit and watch a movie. It might go into the movie might be, oh, I can't possibly do that. Blurting things out, difficult time waiting, um, interrupting. So it can show up in a lot of different ways. Um, and so where we see a lot of the shared symptomatology our challenges with self-care and you can see how when the person's forgetful or isn't planning well due to the executive functioning pieces then it can be hard to engage in um, you know routine and um, consistent uh, meal planning and prepping that's probably one of the big things is the way the self-care can be affected by both ADHD and eating disorders it might be that the person's not keeping their home organized, or it might be that they don't have any groceries and they don't have any food. And so they may get very, very hungry and they may, may go a long time without eating and then sort of need to eat really quickly because they're super hungry and that can lead to binging. Um, and this really can kind of tie in with self-esteem because um, the person with ADHD is often thought of as they're not really getting things done, they're not really trying. Um, and they and they do tr try very often, but then they aren't able to finish the task. So that kind of ties into shame, the third bullet, whereas the person with an eating disorder also can struggle with the shame that is related to internalized weight stigma predominantly and or shame around behaviors with food um, that they may be engaging with. 
this actually leads to learned helplessness where it's like, I keep trying, but I, I'm not succeeding. The person with an eating disorder is trying to be restrictive, trying to control their weight, trying to sort of do what they think is good for them, but then they're just not able to follow, follow through in that in some ways. Or if they are following through, they can be excessively restrictive and have other deterioration of functioning. And with ADHD, that's the same thing. The the helplessness of like trying but not succeeding, trying and being misunderstood. Um, these these kind of concepts, these kind of constructs of seeing oneself are really rampant in both ADHD and eating disorders. I spoke about the executive functioning issues. There's also emotion regulation um, issues. There's stigmatization in both eating disorders and ADHD. Um, abnormalities and reward and response inhibition are both prominent with ADHD and binge eating disorder and um, dopamine level altercation, alterations in both ADHD and BED. So with ADHD, how it can drive that eating disorder is that that locus of control of like, hey, I'm in charge of myself and I'm the one that's responsible for things that happen in my life. It can really be externalize like I've just nothing is working for me I can't do it for myself and so sort of not taking it seems like the person's not taking responsibility for themselves and it's really just sort of that learned helplessness executive functioning where they're, they're just kind of crumbling internally and so it's really just hard to manifest and own that internal locus control that's why in the relationship there and in, in the in the in the connection and the compassion that can be formed we're really working on grounding that and helping the person become more aware of the ways they can empower themselves and make choices, which involves the treatment of ADHD and also the treatment of eating disorders and also setting up structures in their life in order to be able to manage that more internal locus of control. Um, people with eating disorders and ADHD often feel like they're just letting everybody down, like they're going to school and they're not able to do the get get it done with the ADHD point of view or able to function with the eating disorder um, point of view food. So the person may end up with ADHD may self-medicate with food also with a need for soothing and calming due to the restlessness and agitation. So you see that oftentimes with the binging pieces or the sort of emotional grazing process that's sort of a self-soothing piece for the ADHD and the eating disorder. So what we do to treat the co-occurring is, is to actually treat the primary mental health condition of ADHD. Um, stimulants can be used in people with eating disorders judiciously, um, and they really are the gold standard as far as, I mean, I think of ADHD as more of a, a neurological condition than a psychiatric condition. Again, our arbitrary ways of uh, diagnosing and labeling um, the, the, those of us who work with those folks. Um, but the, the, the real gold standard is um, stimulants. Um, I generally am very careful with stimulants with ADHD and eating disorders because um, obviously if a person is severely malnourished and they can cause appetite suppression, that, that's a very significant concern. And on the flip side, the use of stimulants can really help with the executive functioning, which can help planning and preparing a food. And it can also help tremendously with just doing the the, the processing and therapy and the engagement in therapy and the analyzation of thoughts and the, and the relationship building that can happen as a part of being um, treated for the ADHD. So if you're very distracted from ADHD, it's kind of hard to sit in a group therapy session and really process all of this stuff. So um, I usually like to make sure that people are pretty significantly on their way with um, their nutritional rehabilitation. Um, if they're on stimulants, so I just want, I thought that was important to talk a little bit about um, new to, new, the stimulants with, with folks with ADHD. Um, and really just the other components I think are pretty obvious here. And I, I you know, we see these categorization of, of treatment modalities, and it's the same as with categorization of symptoms and diagnosis. Really what it's about is the relationship, but the relationship becomes the vehicle to do some of the CBTE or CBTE the DBT, the interpersonal um, processing, and obviously working with the dietitian around meal planning and, and managing the psychology of the relationship with food. So moving on to PTSD, um, that's my other, so we're now on our third co-occurring condition um, with PTSD, and we're gonna talk about CPTSD 
as well in this presentation in our last few minutes here. So I'll talk a little bit about what PTSD is and then some of the overlap there. So um, some of the symptoms here um, involve intrusion, avoidance, changes in cognition, and changes in um, arousal and reactivity. Um, so um, this is sort of a, lift, a list here, but um, it is really important to inquire about these symptoms and to understand CPTSD, especially in the eating disorder patient. Because what very often happens with the eating disorder patient is that those who also have PTSD, the PTSD doesn't really become apparent because there's so much attention that's being paid to the relationship with food, to the eating disorder, that the eating disorder actually in general functions to cause avoidance of dealing with the trauma in general because everybody is so worried about the eating disorder in the person's life and the person's thoughts and ideas around food and weight and all of the things that are part of the eating disorder presentation really just take over the mind and really make it so that the trauma is not really accessible. I've had so many instances, I can't even begin to tell you, of working on the eating disorder with folks and in that process as the eating disorder became a little bit more manageable and we were doing more soothing and comforting and the person's managing the food better and tolerance that the emergence of memories actually took place and it really shows how the eating disorder in this trauma situation can mask and bury the trauma and it really shows you too how the brain has all these methods and tricks to try to suppress suffering in different ways. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. So that's what I was talking a little bit about. Um, the unresolved trauma may lead to maladaptive coping strategies. Um, and what's very, very interesting um, and important is that in the early, in my earlier career, um, when I had my first higher levels of care going back to 2003, as a matter of fact, to date myself a little bit, um, we used to be told by the insurance companies that we were not to address uh, the trauma if people came into our programs at higher level of care, that they thought by addressing the trauma, the person was going to just decompensate and you just need to take care of the eating disorder and let the outpatient team manage the trauma. And what ended up happening is that recycling of patients, because if you don't actually address the underlying issues that are driving forward the eating disorder, then of course the person's still going to need to have the eating disorder because the eating disorder is as a function, which is to manage the trauma. So it's always useful to really explore when somebody is presenting an eating disorder symptomatology to really begin, begin to understand and explore how is that functioning for them. So that's how comes sometimes when you're working with providers and they just say, oh, we just want to make the eating disorder symptoms go away and teach the person that Ed is like this bad thing and just make Ed go away. Well, if you do that prematurely and you don't say, hold on, let, let me invite Ed over here into the room here and let's find out what, what we're really you know, working with here and what's the point of this and how is this functioning, um, you really can miss out. Um, the aftermath of trauma can also lead to deficits in body signal recognition um, because of the disconnect of mind-body that can happen as a result of of trauma. So that can um, be really something to tap into is the disconnect there. And also um, engaging in eating disorder behavior can actually be a form of self-punishment. And the idea of actually nourishing your body or nurturing your body um, can feel like bad or wrong if, if you've been through some type of trauma that is causing a, a lot of shame. That's why we like to, it's important to talk a lot about shame. And really thinking about the eating disorder um, as a way of managing that shame. I, I sometimes think of it as like the eating disorder is like this judicial you know, process, like the judge and the jury and, and sort of telling the person what their punishment is and sort of creating this way to feel like, okay, I've done something about this horrible thing that's happened in the form of self-deprivation is generally the way it, it goes. Um, the shame and the secrecy, again, you, you hear me talk about shame a lot, um, that can actually complicate and, and treatment 
And the, the anecdote for shame and the anecdote for all of this is through connection and self-compassion. And as I listen to your story and have compassion for you um, in a safe relationship and consistent relationship, I am, I am able to actually um, reduce the shame. Sharing is a really big part of shame reduction. Sharing and caring. It really, really is as simple as it sounds. Um, the history of trauma can make patients feel very overwhelmed as well in the eating disorder treatment. Because again, as I mentioned, as the eating disorder symptoms sometimes are getting tended to, that trauma may become more apparent. Or the person might start having flashbacks or memory. I've had, I've had some just absolutely in, intense and very interesting experiences of people having the surfacing of traumatic memories during eating disorder treatment. It's a very, um, you have to have incredible reverence for the, the um, delicacy of that situation. And it really points again to the importance of relationship in this important work that we do. So I mentioned already some of the co-occurring aspects of the relationship and sharing. I will just say that very, very important is trauma-focused CBT. We want to make sure we're not reinforcing the avoidance. That, that's a big piece of trauma is avoidance. It's a survival strategy. So we do do trauma-focused CBT within our program and a variety of other um, um, modalities of care to make sure you actually are that's a little bit tied in with exposure, right? We have to be able to actually expose and share the things that we have internally um, and process those. So another important thing to point out here is EMDR. EMDR is uh, an indicated treatment modality for trauma. It's a very powerful and uh, potentially impactful uh, treatment for trauma. Um, I remember in, ooh, I guess it was, Ah, I'm going to date myself. 1996, um, I did some work in a little clinic in Keene, New Hampshire, that happened to have a ton of folks with trauma in our clinic. And these people in Keene, New Hampshire, God bless them, they were not only doing DBT at the time, which nobody had, I had never even heard of DBT. They were also, they also were doing EMDR. They were way ahead of their time. When I first heard about EMDR at that time, I thought, oh, that's a bunch of crap. Like, what are they talking about? You know, because I was trained in Western medicine. And I was like, oh, you know, it has to be this, has to be that. Um, until I actually started having some patients that I treated in that clinic. And I was trying different things with medication and medication for anxiety, medication for mood, medication for sleep. And then I would be spinning my wheels sometimes and the patient wasn't getting better until they would start getting EMDR. So I really want to emphasize that it is important to do the actual trauma work when people have eating disorders and not to be a participant in the avoidance by only talking about the eating disorders and to remember that if the patient has trauma and they haven't done trauma-focused CBT or they haven't done EMDR, we really are, it's, we're shortchanging them with a very important domain of care that they may need. And this last series of slides, just to, I thought it might be useful to really understand that cross react, crossover between the avoidance of trauma and the avoidance of the eating disorder version. So the avoidance in trauma is the numbing, the apathy, feeling like you don't care, the detachment, um, like kind of not remembering things, losing interest in activities, like kind of the alexithymia, not expressing moods, avoiding people, places, and situations that remind you of the event, a sense of a foreshortened future. And with the avoidance and eating disorder version, you see the restricting anorexia, not anorexia nervosa, you see restricting anorexia in all forms of eating disorder. Anorexia itself is, is different than anorexia nervosa. The restriction of apathy, uh, the restriction of emotion, we do see these folks that come in that are really suffering, but they're saying, I'm fine, the disconnection from food, disconnection from appetite, hunger. And I say it's a disconnection from the source of life, which is food. And that's really tied in with that sense of so for foreshortened future um, that's so um, significant in those with PTSD. The, the mind, the body, the soul after trauma can just be shut down and sort of not really want to be here. And so that disconnection from the source of life, which is food, is really tied in with 
trauma so often. And if I'm eating, then I'm saying I'm okay with life. I'm okay with moving on, which can just be really counter to how the person's soul is feeling um, who is subjected to trauma. The arousal piece, which we talk about from PTSD point of view, is the concentrate difficulty concentration, the startle response, the hypervigilance, the irritability, the outbursts, the sleeping difficulties. Same thing with eating disorders. Again, it's about the 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 function. It's not about the form. This is an arousal and an eating disorder is is we see this faulty, I call it the faulty alarm system where there's no red alert. Person's starving themselves and it's like, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Or purging, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. You know, no red alert there. But you fit, you eat, you eat, you know, a, a bowl of, you know, Cheerios, right? Which is a completely <laughs> reasonable thing to do and still not enough to eat. But that person's faulty alarm system is triggering that red alert. So it's that arousal piece that you see in both of these conditions. The person can get really irritable and angry around eating. So the eating disorder, again, functions as a discharge for the the irritability and the anger um, and the pain of the trauma. So the again, this is where the function of the eating disorder comes in. It creates this outlet for this pain and this anger and this irritability. And the person's really trapped between the need to eat and the fear of eating. And that is really the trap of the eating disorder. And then the reliving piece in trauma is flashbacks, recurrent memories, dreams, um, physical reactions too that remind the person of the event. And in the eating disorder patient, that was where I was talking about the eating disorder can kind of push away the reliving of the actual flashbacks. When you actually are dealing with the eating disorder, there's that complete preoccupation. When you treat people with eating disorders, you say, how much of your time is spent on food and thinking about food weight? And, and it could be 70, 80, 90% of the time. And as that person gets the treatment for the eating disorder, their flashback now becomes about the trauma. They may remember something that they may not have even previously had a memory of. CPTSD is important to note. It is now in the ICD-10, um, and it is related more to um, very typically result of childhood trauma or chronically invalidating environment. Um, repetitive abuse or neglect, I will say also um, more so than what we see in typical in the classic DSM version of, of uh, PTSD, which is more the really obvious um, trauma, the car crash, the sexual assault, the very obvious loss of somebody in the person's life. So these are as a type of trauma that is not so blatant to the eye, but nonetheless does cause trauma. And the ICD-10, again, does now include CPTSD, complex post-traumatic stress disorder, which is really, really important. As a psychiatrist, I used to really struggle because I would see patients that had PTSD, but they didn't have the classic traumatic event um, that is seen in the DSM. Racism and oppression is also a form of trauma I will want to, I do want to point out. And what I did not list on here, which I should have, this on here is weight stigmatization and internalization of weight stigma events is also a form of trauma. The number one and two perpetrators of weight stigma are your doctor and, and your family. Um, so really important to explore CPTSD as one of the potential traumas. Um, so again, si similar things, but difficulty controlling emotions, this negative self-view, you oftentimes see the very difficult time with relationships um, loss of a symptoms system of meanings and detachment from the trauma. There is some overlap here between what we call CPTSD and what's also called borderline personality disorder. I personally think of uh, borderline personality disorder not really as a disorder, but more as a as a, a maladaptive, but yet adaptive, a way to try to survive um, complex trauma. So that wraps it up for us with six minutes. If there's any um, interest in any little Q&A or if anybody wants to uh, ask questions for Dr. Farrell, we can get those across to him as well. Thank you, Wendy. We do have some questions. Awesome. We have some in the chat and we also have some anonymous questions. Oh.
The first question says, could you speak to the difference between OCD and OCD personality disorder in relation to eating disorders? Ah, very interesting. We should definitely pass that one on to Dr. Nick. Um, the OCPD is not OCD, and a specific, especially I want to point out that it ha the, the level of the preoccupation and the compulsions with specific behaviors that are tied to the obsessive thoughts, that's really more a, the OCD, whereas the OCPD is more thought of as like a personality trait where there might be, you know, an interest in cleanliness or other, um, other areas of their life that, that don't necessarily cause these kind of compulsive patterns of behaviors that just take up so much time. Um, I think that would be, though, the better question to go to uh, Dr. Nick. But as far as the eating disorder overlap with the OCD, um, that's where you really have those specific obsessions and the compulsions that the person might find to do that are turned into eating disorder symptoms that really need specific ERP. And that's what we're doing in treatment. I always say treatment's really hard. You can create a beautiful treatment environment and have um, beautiful relationships. And the person's not going to get better unless they actually do the ERP for those foods. Like if you don't eat pizza when you're in treatment, you're probably not going to eat pizza at the dorm on Saturday night. Are you able to explain the difference between anorexia and anorexia nervosa? Yes. Anorexia itself is loss of appetite. I could have anorexia alone as a result of depression. Depression can cause a subdued appetite. I can have anorexia as a result of chemotherapy. That's not anorexia nervosa. Anorexia nervosa is the mental health condition that we talk about that we've gone through the diagnostic symptoms. So anorexia can be a medical symptom that's related to a medical issue um, or could be related to some manifestation of a uh, of a, another psychiatric condition. Someone in the chat mentioned they'd love to hear your thoughts on treating folks with comorbid ED and ADHD with stimulant medications, given that they're more effective than non-stimulant medications for ADHD. Yeah. Hey, Elizabeth, good question. I agree. I absolutely agree that they generally are more effective and that's how come I don't rule out the use of stimulants in folks with ADHD. I mean, ADHD plus eating disorders. I know that um, there's different people who have different views on it and I, I've just do, been doing this a long time. And so I guess I have my own lived experience. Um, and I don't believe that it's a black or white thing that, oh my gosh, if you have an eating disorder, you absolutely cannot be on a stimulant. Um, I was mentioning that I do think if you are giving a medication that does cause appetite suppression as a byproduct of the medication, there's a need for a tremendous amount of oversight and monitoring in that case. I do feel it's important for the patients that I treat. My approach is that if there is a nutritional deficiency, that they do have to be very significantly far along on nutritional rehabilitation in order for me to use the stimulant. But I think there's a catch-22 also when you don't use the stimulant because the use of the stimulant can help you process things in therapy and the use of the stimulant can help with executive functioning, which ties into self-care and practices that are going to help reinforce the eating disorder recovery, not just with regard to nutrition, but self-care in general, whereas like gentle movement or other aspects of self-care that are really, really important. So that the ADHD person with an eating disorder has a, it's really a double whammy here, right? Where you've got the eating disorder and then the executive functioning difficulty can make it really hard to do the work involved to heal from the eating disorder. So if you just say, absolutely not, I think, I think you're really missing out. At the same time, if you're not incredibly careful and judicious about monitoring the nutritional piece of the person's life, how are they eating when I'm prescribing this medication? Are they losing weight? Are they restricting? Um, am I using the absolute lowest possible dose, right? Those are the things to consider. Unfortunately, and so often we human beings, we just want to have a list of what to do in this situation or that situation. No, it boils down to knowing, having a relationship with the patient, knowing the patient and being really careful and attuned with that particular patient. I definitely don't rule it out.
Thank you. We are actually at time. This was an excellent oh. presentation, Dr. Oliver Pyatt, and huge shout out to Dr. Farrell for joining. Oh my God, he's amazing. So he is great. So grateful he to be here with everybody. I thank everybody, Jamie. Thank you and everybody at Within for making the summit possible. I really appreciate the attendees today. Um, so thanks, everybody. Thank you guys. And our next session is going to start right now at 1230 oh with Kate Scafati and Dr. Harrop that will be talking about weight stigma, challenges and solutions in higher level of care. I love Thanks it. For that is in your All CEO right. dashboard. Oh, if anybody wants to come to my talk on shame, I would love to have you there. Thank yes, you. That would be Friday. So we Friday. will see. Okay. I, re I couldn't remember when. Thank you, Jamie. Bye everybody. Bye. Thank you.